So, in this uh, and the next lecture, um, we will be looking at uh, examples uh, which require us to carry out first law analysis of systems. We will uh, do examples involving both uh, ideal gases and um, uh, two phase mixtures of uh, water as well as R134A. So, let us start with a few examples uh, involving ideal gases. Okay? The first example actually uh, involves um, a liquid and a solid. So, we have 2 kg of ice in a container. So, the container initially, uh, so let us say we have a container like this. So, this initially contains liquid water at uh, 20 degrees Celsius and uh, <coughs> we have a certain amount of ice which is uh, 2 kilogram. So, 2 kilogram of ice at 0 degrees Celsius is dropped into this uh, container. Uh, of uh, liquid water and then we also add 3500 kilojoules of heat uh, to the container. Okay? So, assuming that there is a uh, constant pressure and there is no loss of heat to the surroundings, we are asked to determine the final temperature and mass of water vapor formed if any. We do not know whether uh, any of the water is converted to vapor or not, but if it is then we are asked to calculate the uh, amount of water vapor formed. Okay. So, for us the system uh, in this case is uh, relatively easy to identify. We take uh, the ice and the liquid water in the container uh, to be the system. Okay. So, when the ice is dropped into the water it will melt and perhaps all of the both of them would evaporate together, but this system will contain the same amount of mass. So, we take that to be our system and we apply first law. But what we would do is since we do not know how much of the uh, water if any is going to evaporate, let us uh, calculate the amount of heat that is required to take this system to a final temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. Right? We are assuming that in everything is at atmospheric pressure. So, uh, we require the I mean we calculate the amount of heat required to take the system to 100 degrees Celsius and if the supplied heat exceeds this then we know that some of the water is going to evaporate, we can calculate the amount of water that evaporates after that. This uh, is a very logical way of approaching the problem and there are other shorter ways perhaps, but this is a very logical way of approaching this problem. So, let us uh, do it that way. Okay? So, we apply first law delta E equal to Q minus W. In this case for the system under consideration there is no, there are no uh, kinetic energy changes, there is no there are no potential energy changes, only the internal energy change uh, is present. So, we write delta E equal to delta U equal to Q minus W. Now, none of the uh, system boundaries deform during this process th which means displacement work is 0 and no other form of work interaction is also there. We do not have electrical work or steering work or any spring work anything like that. So, we take W to be equal to 0. Okay? So, which means that the internal energy change in internal energy of the system is equal to the heat that is supplied and the system itself is comprised of ice and liquid. Uh, liquid water. So, delta U ice plus delta U liquid is equal to Q. Okay? So, uh, if you uh, focus on the ice, then the ice at 0 degree Celsius melts to form water at 0 degree Celsius and it is then heated to 100 degree Celsius. Okay? So, the change in internal energy for this process comes out to be the latent heat that is required to uh, take the ice from ice at 0 degree Celsius to water at 0 degree Celsius and then the amount of heat that has to be supplied to take it to a final temperature of 100 degree Celsius. Okay? Now, for the liquid water it is initially at 20 degree Celsius. So, the change in internal energy for the liquid water would be uh, m liquid times the specific heat capacity of the liquid times the change in temperature which is 100 minus 20. So, the sum of these two would be the amount of heat that is required to take the system to a final temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. Okay? So, if you substitute the numbers, we get this to be 3188 kilojoules. So, we need to supply this much heat to take the ice at 0 degree Celsius and the water at 20 degree Celsius combined to 100 degree Celsius. Okay? The heat actually added is 3500 kilojoules, so that is more than this. So, we know that some of the water will definitely evaporate. Uh, we, we, what we do next is, as I said, there are shorter methods for doing this, but let us just look at the uh, uh, logic behind doing, uh, you know, 
logic behind solving this problem. So, if all of the water evaporates, then the amount of heat required for that is given by m ice plus m liquid times L prime, where L prime is the latent heat of evaporation. And if you substitute the numbers, that comes out to be 15,820. So, which means that this is not uh, sufficient to evaporate all of the water. So, the amount of water that will, that will evaporate can be calculated by taking 312, which is the excess heat divided by the latent heat. So, that comes out to be 0 0.1381 kilogram. Okay. So, the analysis uh, proceeds um, in almost all examples along the same lines. You identify the system and uh, then you uh, go through the analysis by applying first law in a, uh, in a in a consistent manner and then you go through the analysis okay that is most important identification of the system applying first law to the system and then proceeding when, but there will be increasing degree of complexity as we go through the examples this is a very very simple example okay let's go to the next example here we have a, a frictionless piston cylinder uh, piston cylinder mechanism okay so this initially contains uh, air and um, uh, the the air in the cylinder is compressed from 100 kilopascal to a final pressure of 800 kilopascal and the process uh, is given as PV raised to n equal to constant where n is equal to 1.27. Such a process is usually called a polytropic process with n being called the polytropic or index exponent. Okay? We are asked to evaluate the work done and the heat interaction. Okay, so, the assembly is not insulated, it is only frictionless which means there is going to be some heat interaction between the, um, the cylinder and the surroundings. So, it is quite clear that we take the air in the cylinder as our system. So, here we are looking at polytropic processes for different indices on a PV diagram. This is for ideal gas. Okay, So, it is very important to keep that in mind. Notice that n equal to 0 represents uh, an isobaric process where p is constant and n tending to infinity represents an isochoric process for which the volume remains constant. All other processes fall in between n equal to 1 is an isothermal process. So, this is isobaric and this is isochoric and n equal to gamma for an ideal gas as we will see later is call, is an isentropic process where entropy remains constant. N equal to 1 is isothermal where temperature remains constant. All the other processes lie in between. So, if your initial state is 1, then states on the second quadrant are obtained by compression processes and states on the fourth, uh, fourth quadrant are obtained as a result of or at the end of expansion processes. Okay, so, we take the air as a system and the work interaction, uh, remember we have only displacement work in this case that is integral P dV. So, integral 1 to 2 P dV, we substitute the process equation, we know how P is related to V that is explicitly given in this uh, example. So, we can get this to be equal to this and since uh, we assume air to be an ideal gas, we can take P V equal to M R T. So, we finally end up with an expression that looks like this. Okay. For air, we take the molecular weight to be 28.8 and gamma to be 7 fifths. So, we can calculate the specific gas constant or particular gas constant as the universal gas constant divided by the molecular weight and C V is nothing but R over gamma minus 1 from Mayer's relationship. We derived this earlier. So, we will be making use of these two. Now, P V raised to n equal to constant may also be rewritten as P raised to 1 minus n over n times t equal to constant once we use the equation of state. So, we can apply this to the initial and final state and get the final temperature to be 467 Kelvin. So, once I know the final temperature, I can actually substitute these values into the expression for displacement work and get it to be equal to minus 357.11 which means that since the air is compressed, the negative sign is consistent with the fact that uh, work is being done on the system to increase the pressure. 
Now, we apply first law to this system. So, delta E equal to Q minus W. In this case also, uh, there is no change in potential energy of the system and there is no change in the kinetic energy of the system. There is no work except uh, displacement work. So, we can write delta E equal to delta U equal to Q minus W, which may then be rewritten like this. Okay? So, delta U is uh, as we said before M C V times T 2 minus T 1 and if you substitute the values Q comes out to be minus 116.06. The negative sign indicates that heat is lost by the system to the surroundings as the air is compressed. Now, uh, at this point uh, uh, students at least uh, quite a few students have uh, a question which is that since C V is a specific heat at constant volume. Uh, should it not be applied only to constant volume processes? How are we uh, justified in using C V for this process? Okay. One must keep in mind that when we uh, wrote the expression for total energy, we, uh, you may recall that we derived the cyclic, uh, uh, the first law for a cyclic process and then we identified E as a property and you may recall that we wrote E is equal to U plus P E plus K E. We know that K E is a property, P is a property, E is a property, so U is also a property of the system which means that u depends only on the initial and the final state and not on the process by which we arrive at that state. And you may also recall that we further uh, wrote the um, specific internal energy u to be equal to 5 halves R T, depending uh, based on the degrees of freedom that a diatomic gas had correct. So, um, we wrote it to be uh, 5 halves R T. Uh, notice that T is a property, so which means that U is also a property and uh, depends only on the initial and final states. From this, we uh, identified, so we wrote this as C V times T and we uh, equated C V uh, to be 5 halves R for this case per unit mass. Okay? Uh, so, uh, this is independent of the process. So, the fact that delta U equal to M times C V times delta T is independent of the process and C V is equal to 5 halves R, again it does not depend on the process. Okay? It is called specific heat at constant volume because as we wrote earlier, uh, if we uh, go back a little bit, as we uh, wrote earlier, as we wrote earlier C V is equal to partial U partial T and uh, remember we said U is a function of T comma specific volume, it has to be a function of two uh, properties because we are dealing with the simple compressible substance. So, C V uh, when we take the partial derivative, it is understood that V is a constant here because we are taking partial derivative with respect to T, V is a constant which is why it is called specific heat at constant volume. But it does not mean that it is dependent on the process. Okay? The constant at constant volume refers to the fact that we have to take a partial derivative because this is a function of two variables. Okay? So, that uh, completes this example. Let us move on to the next example. So, here we have an insulated vessel like this. Notice that the insulation is uh, indicated here through this hatching. We have an insulated vessel and side A is initially evacuated. We have a stirrer in compartment B and there is also membrane which will uh, rupture if the pressure exceeds 1 mega Pascal in compartment B. So, we have a certain amount of uh, air uh, in uh, compartment B. So, work is transferred uh, externally through uh, the shaft to the stirrer and the stirrer is turned until the mem uh, until the membrane ruptures. Okay? So, once the membrane ruptures, the air uh, fills the entire vessel. We are asked to calculate the uh, final temperature or temperature in B when the membrane ruptures, the work done by the stirrer and the final temperature and pressure once equilibrium is attained. Remember, this is evacuated initially, which means that this, this will be an there will be an unresisted expansion when the membrane ruptures. Okay? So, that is a non-equilibrium process. What we are asked to calculate is the final equilibrium temperature and pressure. So, we take the entire vessel to be our system as shown here and as we discussed earlier. <coughs> 
So, let us uh, proceed with the example. So, the initial temperature may be evaluated uh, in B may be evaluated by using equation of state in this manner to get the initial temperature to be 303 Kelvin. Now, the membrane ruptures when the pressure in compartment B is 1 MPa. So, the temperature of the air in compartment B when the membrane ruptures may also be calculated quite easily using the equation of state. So, once it reaches 433 Kelvin, the membrane ruptures. So, this process is labeled 1, 2. So, starting with the initial state until the time when the membrane instant when the membrane ruptures is uh, we identify that as process 1, 2. <clears throat> so, we can apply first law. So, we write delta E equal to delta U because there is no change in PE or there is no change in Q, uh, KE. There is no heat interaction because the vessel is insulated and W12 uh, uh, consists only of stirrer work. There is no displacement work. Displacement work is 0 because there is no deformation of the system boundary. Okay. We have identified the system to be to contain the entire vessel. So, there is no uh, deformation of system boundary. Okay. So, delta u uh, is uh, for the system is simply m times C v times T 2 minus T 1 for the uh, air in compartment B. So, we may evaluate this as uh, minus 187.64 which means uh, work done by the stirrer is 187.64 kilojoules. Okay. So, let us say that the final equilibrium state is uh, numbered 3 and we apply first law for process 2, 3. Uh, again, uh, delta E is equal to delta U uh, is equal to Q minus W. Q is uh, 0 because vessel is insulated. In this case, for 2, 3, W displacement is already 0 because there is no deformation of the system boundary. The stirrer is also stopped once the membrane ruptures that is given in the problem statement. So, there is no work interaction for process 2, 3 which means that the temperature remains constant. So, the final temperature may be obtained as 433 Kelvin. And knowing the final temperature and the final volume, remember the air now occupies the entire vessel, we can calculate the final pressure to be 333.33 kilopascal. The next example is uh, somewhat involved, uh, straightforward, but quite involved in terms of work that we do. So, we have two cylinders here of different cross sectional areas. The bottom cylinder, as indicated here, is completely insulated. Both the piston and the cylinder are insulated. Now, heat is supplied to the air. So, it, uh, this contains air, this also contains air. So, heat is supplied to the air in uh, compartment A or cylinder A and the piston moves slowly down by a uh, distance of 2 meters. Okay. Uh, we are asked to calculate a bunch of quantities here as you can see. Uh, areas are given, total distance is given, mass of the piston, piston assembly is also given. So, let us uh, proceed with the analysis. So, first quantity which is asked is mass of air in cylinder A. So, we can calculate it using ideal gas equation of state. All the values are known. So, that comes out to be 0.2 kilograms. Now, at any instant uh, during the process, a force balance on the piston looks like this. So, uh, this is the differential pressure. So, if you look at this. So, the weight of the piston acts in the downward direction. Uh, the pressure at A acts in the downward direction, but the atmospheric pressure on the lower face of this piston acts in the upward direction. So, the net force in the downward direction is P here minus P atmosphere times the cross sectional area. Now, the pressure of the air in cylinder B uh, acts in the upward direction. Atmospheric pressure acts in the downward direction on this piston. So, the net force is P B minus P atmosphere times area in the upward direction. So, the force balance may be written like this and if we rearrange this then uh, and use the known values, take all the known quantities to the right hand side, we can get the pressure in compartment B to be initial pressure in compartment B to be 325.45 kilopascal.
So once I know the uh, pressure, I can uh, I am given the initial temperature also. So I can use the equation of state to evaluate the mass of air in the uh, in cylinder B as 0.15 kilogram. Now, work interaction for atmosphere basically is P atmosphere times delta V for the atmosphere, okay, because the atmospheric pressure remains constant. Now, delta V for the atmosphere has to be calculated carefully because this uh, piston assembly moves down by 2 meters, okay. That means uh, the volume occupied by the atmosphere decreases on this side and it increases on this side, okay. So, delta V on the A side actually is negative delta V on the B side is positive for the atmosphere. So, we calculate. So, delta V um, on the A side is minus 2 times A cross sectional area on that side because the piston moves down by 2 meters and delta V on the B side same height times the cross sectional area with the positive sign. So, the work interaction for the atmosphere comes out to be minus 786 joules which means work is done on the atmosphere. Now, the piston work comes out to be positive based on the elevation change because the piston moves down, okay. As a, so, the, which means that and there is a, a reduction in potential energy of the piston, which means that the piston is doing work on the surroundings or whatever it is interacting with. So, that is plus 200 joules. Now, if I consider the air uh, in B as my system. Okay, at any instant, I can apply first law to the air here and write like this for a differential change. Here we are using the differential form of the first law because we are applying it at an instant. Okay, dE equal to du, no change in ke or pe, equal to delta q minus delta w. Delta q is zero because B is insulated, as we already mentioned, and the only form of work is displacement work, so minus p dv. Now, if I substitute for du, uh, I can write it as mcv dt and this may be written as in terms of specific volume as minus m times p times dv. Rearrange and integrate, we finally get uh, this equation which describes the process undergone by the air in cylinder B, which is simply nothing but t times specific volume V raised to the power gamma minus 1 is equal to a constant. So, this is the equation that describes the adiabatic fully resisted process. Remember the air, the cylinder and the piston are insulated uh, on the B side. So, and the process takes place slowly. So, the process undergone by the air in the B side is an adiabatic fully resisted process, okay, which is described by this. So, I can calculate the final pressure in uh, uh, B using this equation. The final volume is V initial volume minus 2 times the cross sectional area. So, we get the final pressure in B to be 442.84 kilo Pascal. Final temperature in B may also be evaluated using equation of state as 327 Kelvin. We know the final volume, we know the final pressure, we can easily calculate the temperature. Now, if I apply first law to the air in the uh, in, in cylinder B, remember previously we applied first law to the air in cylinder B at an instant. So, we use the differential form of the law. Now, we are applying uh, first law to the air in cylinder B uh, for the entire process. So, we write delta E equal to delta U equal to Q minus W. And so, the displacement work for the air in B comes out to be minus 2923 joules. Clearly, work is being done on the air in cylinder B and the magnitude is 2923 joules. Now, I know the uh, final pressure we have already calculated, uh, we have already calculated the final pressure in cylinder B. So, using our force balance equation, I can now evaluate the final pressure in cylinder A. In the beginning, we use the force balance equation to calculate the final pressure, uh, to calculate the initial pressure in B. Now, we are using the final pressure in B to calculate the final pressure in cylinder A and that comes out to be 258.7 kilo Pascal, less than the pressure in cylinder B. The final volume of cylinder of air in cylinder A is higher by uh, 2 times the cross sectional area because the piston assembly moves down by 2 meters. So, that 
may be evaluated quite easily and using the equation of state we may evaluate the final temperature of air in cylinder A to be 458 Kelvin. Now, if you apply first law to the uh, air in cylinder A, you get delta E equal to delta U equal to Q minus W. Q is not 0 here because we are supplying heat to the air in uh, cylinder A. So, uh, we can rewrite this expression as delta U A plus W A. Okay. Notice that uh, the work interaction for the air in cylinder A plus <coughs> work interaction for air in cylinder B plus W piston plus W atmosphere is equal to 0. Okay. So, if I take the air then the uh, work done for the system plus work done for surroundings is 0. For the air in cylinder A surroundings consist of so surroundings it is interacting with consists of air in cylinder B, the piston plus atmosphere. So, the sum of all this is equal to 0. So, I can replace W A with negative of W B plus W piston plus W atmosphere substitute the values we get uh, heat supplied to be at 26.315 kilojoules. Okay. The problem is involved, uh, but uh, conceptually not very uh, difficult to follow. You need to do this systematically, identify the system, apply the first law, use the equation of state and then proceed based on the information that is given in the problem.